We're talking about the concrete prints and what is allowed in the code, the ACI code. If you are doing gravity design, which means not related to seismic, you know, seismic means structures and buildings. Um, supporting seismic forces, like earthquake forces. If you just do gravity, minimum concrete strength that you can use is 2,500 PSI. There is no limit for the maximum. You can just use any concrete. You can go up to 12,000 PSI with certain restrictions when it comes to certain parameters or design values in the concrete. But when you do seismic members, seismic member means members, is going to be used to support earthquake forces. This is why they call these special moon frames and special structure walls. This one you have your seismic design. In this case here, for the normal weight, the limit was taken out. If you have lightweight construction, it's gonna be 5,000 PSI. Older code will completely different. These values would really low. Now they just put it as none, which means that there is no maximum. You can use any value. When you have seismic members, Size framing you design for a minimum of 3,000 PSI. The importance of this when you develop construction document like drawings and design, right? So you need to specify there which materials have you used, what strength, and this is where you're taking from. Which means if I'm doing here some foundation on some beams, I cannot specify to me 2,000 PSI. It's getting a minimum of 2,500 PSI. It's okay to put that 6,000, 7,000, 4,000, whatever you pick. It's going to be up to you. In typical construction, we'd like to use 4,000, maybe 4,500. If you are doing residential, let's say foundation, maybe stay use 2,500. But once you go to commercial and industrial, maybe you'd like to go to 4,000, 4,500 PSI. Unless you're doing seismic, it's going to be maybe 5,000 PSI for shear walls and for um, moment frames. The values I just mentioned is kind of typical, which means if you are working in the industry, this is what you'd use. But does it mean that you can change it? You can use for shear walls instead of 5,000, you can use 4,500 if you want to. You can use 4,000, you can use 3,500. As long as you don't go below 3,000, but I'm just saying you're the typical, the standard values that you use in our design. Now, once you start here to work with lightweight concrete, we have a factor that comes into our analysis. We call this lambda. It's kind of modification factor here that you use. And usually once you see an equation that has a square root of F prime C, F prime C is gonna be the concrete strength. Once you see this factor there in any equation, you're gonna see a lambda factor that comes with it. And the code gives you here this table with this lambda value. So you know exactly how to use it and where to use it. It says here, there is no change. If you have normal weight concrete, so I'm gonna start here from the bottom. So your factor is going to be equal to one, which means there is no modification factor, no reduction to the trends of the concrete as long as you use your normal weight concrete. Problem is going to happen once you start to look at some lightweight option. So once you start to say, I'm looking here for lightweight, whether it's going to be rock or sand or both, you're going to see here some modification factor. Let me go quickly through this so that you know what does it mean by that. When it says here all lightweight, which means sand is gonna be lightweight and the rock also is gonna be lightweight. If you see here, sand lightweight, which means sand only is gonna be lightweight and the rock is gonna be normal weight. This is gonna be a combination of both of them. Usually what we care about is gonna be two values that we need to use in our analysis. Once you see here the term lightweight, just go ahead and use 0.75. Because you'd never know what's gonna happen during construction. Even if you specify only rock to be lightweight, most likely concrete supplier is gonna give you, everything is gonna be lightweight. So just to be on the safe side, either that you're gonna have normal weight, and in this case, that's what you have in your drones, it's gonna be one, or lightweight, you just use 0.75. So it's gonna be up to you. You decide exactly which material that you'd like to go with. I'm gonna go back here one step. Concrete strength, just to show you what we have started with. We put here the concrete properties, and then we say this is gonna be 
the performance of the concrete spaceman under compression. The concrete strength that we call it here, 5,000 or 2,500 or whatever, this is gonna be the maximum value that you're gonna be reaching under compression test. So 5,000 PSI means maximum strength the cylinder is gonna be able to take or the spaceman is gonna be equal to 5,000 PSI. All concrete are assumed to fail at 0.03 strain value. This value here we call F prime C. This F prime C, usually what happens, we have concrete cylinders, we test them under compression, after 28 days of being casted. So first you cast a cylinder, you have them ready, and the reason that you have it after 28 days and not 30 days because you'd like to wait here four weeks. So let's say if you pour the concrete on Monday, your test is gonna be also on Monday, so you don't forget. This is the only reason. There's no magic number about waiting 28 days. If you pour it in Wednesday, you're gonna be testing Wednesday in four weeks from now. We're concerned that the concrete is reaching the specified value. This gonna be the specified value. Specified means your target, whatever that you're asking for. You call it 5,000, means that you want using your analysis 5,000. At 28 days, the concrete is gonna be reaching to this strength, the fluid trend that you're mentioning, or you'd like to get to. So at day one, the concrete maybe is gonna be at 10%. And this is gonna increase with time. And once you get to 28 days, the concrete is gonna be at full strength. Full strength means that the concrete strength, the actual concrete strength, if you take samples and test them, they're gonna get you same values that you consider in your analysis, which is let's say in our case or our example is gonna be 5,000 PSI. Now let's talk about the reinforcing bars. Reinforcing bars are gonna look like this like what you have here in this picture. What we call here, we call this deformation. And this deformation, the reason that we have it is to develop the bond between the rebars and between the concrete, surrounding concrete around it. You know, once you put one of the three bars in the concrete, you'd like to see some bond. You don't want it to slip. So in order for you to provide this bond, you need to have some deformation. If you don't have deformation, we call it smooth bars. We don't use this at most bars in concrete construction. Usually we use this deformant bars. If you look here at a sample that you are taking and test it in tension, this is the standard tension test that we do in reinforcing bars. You start to apply tension force on the rebar. And for that, you're gonna see some extension. In mechanics of materials and strengths of materials, I'm sure that you guys have seen this before. A test of reinforcing bars or a piece of a steam. It's gonna be exactly the same thing. If you take here the tension force divided by the cross-section area of the steel rebar, like in here, let's say this gonna be the cross-section area, and you're gonna have a tension force here. Take this tension force divided by the cross-section area, it's gonna get you a value that we call here stress. The same time when you have an extension, any extension of the bar, elongation, take this elongation or extension, divide by the original length of the spacement. This is what you call the strain. The strain is unitless because when you take here extension or elongation of a rebar divided by the original length, this is gonna be inch per inch, which means it's gonna be unitless. So the x-axis, you're gonna see here the strain, unitless. The y-axis, you're gonna see stress unit, which is gonna be either PSI which means pound per square inch, or KSI as in K per square inch. One kep equals a thousand pounds. And with that, you start here to develop your stress strain diagram. So what you are looking here at is a stress strain diagram for the reinforcing bars. At the beginning, you apply some tension, so you have some stress and you have some strain, and you're still in the linear relationship, which means that you're still in the elastic range. Once you hit the point here, this point we call the yield point, you're gonna see no resistance to the reinforcing spacement. So the steel bar here is not resisting. You have lots of elongation and no resistance at all in this region here. This is why we call it yielding because now the rebar is yielding to the tension applied on it. You have lots of strains and no gain in stress. Now the rebar is kind of gone. So between this point, the zero point, and between the yield point, we call this the elastic range. 
again in the y-axis you have the stress in the x-axis you have the strain units the slope of this line is called the modulus of elasticity and this modulus of elasticity is going to be the slope of this line is going to be equal to the y component divided by the x component if the y component here units is going to be ksi and the x components going to be unitless e sub s which means the modulus you may also call it youngest modulus if you like units of it is going to be also the same units as the stress so it's going to be also ksi the standard value for this es is 29000 ksi the standard for all the steels is fixed value for rebars used in our business in our concrete design is going to be maybe 40 ksi or 60 ksi or 75 ksi where do you have them you have a reference yes it's right here 40 60 and 75 this gave you like the common values if you order any reinforcing bars it's going to come as 60. so this is like the typical this 40 doesn't exist anymore but we still have it in the code just in case so mainly it's going to be 60. 75 is not available unless you have a special order for it so i'm going to say users gonna be 60 ksi for the yield defense of the rebars and actually this is the value that we'd like to use in our design and our analysis so here we're going to have the yield plateau and then after lots of strain all of a sudden the rebar is going to show some resistance so the curve here is going to be going up we call this point here the strain hardening because here the rebar is going to start to pick some forces it's going to go to the highest point we call this ultimate stress after that's going to decline a little bit and then the steel is going to fail which we call this maximum steel strength it's going to be right here the value i'm going to be interested in when i look here at this stress strain relationship in my concrete design is going to be three values i'm really interested in this f sub one this one i'm going to be using in my design i don't want the steel to be let's say in this region or in here this is going to be critical why because this is going to be the maximum stress that i'm going to be using in my analysis so if i'm doing any analysis it's okay for me to have the stress and the strain to be between this point zero and between the strain hardening so it's going to be this area here i don't want it to be here I can because I don't want it to get close to this point otherwise I can just be easily here I don't want to snap the rebars this basically it so I'd like to keep the strain between this point and between this point for the stress I understand if I keep the strain from here to there maximum stress I'm going to be able to use for the reinforcing bars is going to be 6 ksi why because it's going to be daily trends so my maximum stress if I'm doing here any analysis is going to be 6 ksi why 60 because it's going to be the common value if you have different three bars of course it's going to be the 75 ksi but when it comes to the strain i'd like to keep the strain between the zero point and between this point so as i said i'm interested here in three values so the first value is going to be this f sub y second value e sub s 29,000 ksi constant and the third one is going to be this strain at yield point and i can figure this out easily because i know that this value here e sub s is going to be equal to f sub y divided by absolute sub s you have a couple of values you can figure out this value here if you do the analysis here for 6 ksi you say 6 ksi divided by 29000 is going to get you 0 0.002 it just happened to be 0 0.002 i'm going to take you back here one slide for a couple of slides here so right at the end point the strain in the steel is going to be about here and i can consider here that the concrete is going to be failing at 0.03 because the code says so the code says after 0.03 concrete is not working anymore so the reason that i am going back to this one so that you have the feeling the difference in the strain in concrete and steel concrete is going to be failing at 0.03 yield point is going to be at 0.02 but in the steel 
just to have an idea. Moving forward here to this line. Now, did you guys hear about the ASTM or do you know what does mean by ASTM? No. Okay, uh, ASTM, American Standard for Testing and Materials. Um, this organization, their job is to develop specifications for materials. For example, the rebars that we use in reinforced concrete, we call it a rebar, it is made out of steam. Now the question is, what does it mean by steam for you? If I bring any material, for example, I'm gonna bring you here this marker. You're gonna say, this is plastic. You're gonna say, how would you know it's plastic? I'm gonna say, yeah, because I do this, I bend it, I know it's plastic. But this is not enough because you need to do some testing on it to prove that this is plastic. Same thing with the rebar. If I bring here any piece of material or metal and say this is here is steel, you need to say why it is a steel. And which specifications can be following because we have lots of different steels. We have a stainless steel, we have rebar steel, we have mild steel, we have high trans steel, we have lots of, even in stainless, we have maybe six or eight different stainless steel. So you need to have your specification to constitute the meaning of this three bar of a steel. Something to say, if you do the following testing, testing not just mechanical testing. What I was talking here about, this is what we call here mechanical testing, but we have also chemical testing because you can take the piece of rebar and do some analysis on it, some chemical testing and figure out the composition of this. So we have mechanical properties, we have chemical properties, we have shape, so the shape also is giving an issue. We have size. So the rebar needs to conform with the requirements or to conform with ASTM A615 and A706. It's gonna be one of these two, if you wanna use it in concrete. You go here to the specifications of ASTM A615 and then you find out all the requirements. If you like to call this piece a rebar, you need to satisfy all the requirements provided in the A615. Otherwise, you don't really call it a rebar. This includes lots of information, lots of test values. For example, at the A615, it says, minimum yield strength, if you like to use here grade 60, we call this grade 60, it's gonna be six KSI minimum. They don't give you a maximum, which means if the steel is gonna get you here 100 KSI, you're good. It's gonna be lots of other information also provided with it. Also in the ASTM A615, they give you this table. They say all of the three bars, they come in size, the specific size. We call this size number three, number four, number five, number six, all the way to number 11. We have also 14, but it's not really used. You don't really use it in our design construction. So what does it mean by size number three or size number four or size number eight? It means that the diameter is three eighths of an inch, four eighths, five eighths, six eighths, seven eighths, 8.8, eight, which means one inch. So rebar number eight is gonna have a diameter of one inch. Three is gonna be three eight. Four is gonna be half inch and so forth. So this is easy to understand. Nominal diameter here is not the actual diameter. It's close to the actual diameter because you have certain tolerance in the production process and it's okay to be a little bit different from the nominal size. So I guess we understand here the bar size, we're gonna call it, let's say number six means three quarter of an inch, because it's gonna be six eight. So usually we don't call it six eight, we just call it number six, the answer is gonna be 0.75. Cross section area of the rebar, like in here, this cross section area is gonna be according to this table. So for example, you say number six rebar is gonna have a cross section area of 0.44. Do not try to calculate this. Don't say it's gonna be equal to pi r squared or pi d squared divided by four and use the three quarter. So don't say it's gonna be pi 3.14 times 0.75 the squared divided by four, don't do it this way. This is wrong. If you do this, you're gonna be losing some points here, all right? So what you need to do is just use this table. Just open the table and look this up. Just read it off this table. Don't try to calculate it out yourself. 
the bar that you'd like to use because it's so simple is of course is gonna be number nine. Why? Because cross section area is one square inch. So it's simple. You cannot forget this. And if you start to practice here after maybe a week or two weeks, you will just memorize this table. It's gonna be so simple for you. You don't really need to say and say, I'd like to use number nine because it's easy. You just use any rebar and you memorize the cross section area. Uh, for this course, you don't have to. You just need to look it up. Any questions? Sounds good. Uh, All right. Um, the nominal uh, diameter is one eighth of the bar size. Nominal diameter means the diameter of the rebar, like in here, distance from here to there. It says nominal because if you measure the actual rebar diameter, it's not exactly this. It's gonna be close to it. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay. So when you purchase a piece of rebar, this is gonna be like the symbols and information that you're gonna see on it. The bar size is gonna be typed in here. Uh, but if you're in the construction business and you like figure out the rebar diameter, you're not gonna be looking for this. You just look at the bar and figure out the size because you're just gonna be used to it, right? You have other information, like for example, if it says S here, it means it's gonna be A615. You know what is A615, A996? It means the source of the steel, where it's come from, the chemical composition of it. A615 is what you'd like to use. So I'm gonna say you'd like to see this S. And then you have the bar size, and then you see the production mills, Gabby, let's say edge or other stuff. Any questions? We are good. I'm gonna be moving to the second or the following slide set. Okay, like what it says here, uncrank reinforced concrete sections. You guys, you know that use a concrete cracks. And you cannot stop it from cracking. You can control the amount of cracks. If you'd like to minimize it. But you cannot stop it because concrete it has cement, cement shrinks, and once shrink is gonna happen, you're gonna see some cracks in there. I'm gonna skip the slide for a second. Just gonna be starting with this one. This is a typical reinforced concrete section. For the width of the section, we usually call it B. For the depth, we call it H. So what is H? Total depth, not just the depth, total depth. If you're gonna put this beam here in a simply supported structure. I'm expecting compressions gave you on the top and tensions gave you on the bottom. Does it make sense to everyone? Any yes. any objection? Do you need any clarification why the tensions gave you at the bottom, compressions gave you on the top? Yeah, can you just explain that? Okay. Here's the beam. Let's say simply supported beam. And you see here the flex downwards. Of course, you have here loss of exaggeration, right? It's not gonna deflect that much. Deflection is gonna be very small. So what happens if you have a support here and a support there, you're gonna start to put some loads, what's gonna happen? Tension is gonna be here and compression is gonna be here. Look at the original distance from these two points. What happened to it? Because of deflection and deformation, so we're gonna get further away from each other, which means they're gonna see some tension. On the top, getting close to each other, they're gonna see compression. And actually, it's gonna be the moment direction. We call this positive moment. What does it mean by positive moment in a beam? It means that you have tension on the bottom, compression on the top. Are we good about this? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, great. So, concrete is very good in compression. Concrete is really bad in tension. Cannot take any tension. 
tension resistance of the concrete is very low. So what's going to happen here? We need to provide the steel in the tension side because steel is good in tension. Steel also is good in compression as long as you restrain it from buckling. Just think about the rebar. Apply tension to it. It resists up to this much. Once you start to apply compression, the rebar is going to buckle, which means it's going to get bent from the compression force. So steel, problem when it comes to compression, is going to be buckling. But if you put it within the concrete, it doesn't have a place to go. So it's going to stay in there, and it's not going to buckle. So again, as we said, concrete is going to be very good in compression. And when it comes to tension side, I'm going to put this reinforcement bar. If here we have compression, here we are going to have tension, there should be like a boundary line between the compression and tension. Any concrete below this line is going to start to crack. So all the concrete here below is going to start to crack. Now the reinforcing bar is going to get triggered. Now it's going to get active. Why? Because you can see here some tension. And the compression is getting the top. So we call this the compression zone, and this is going to be the tension zone. We put the rebars at a depth of D from the top fibers of the compression. So what is D here? D is going to be the concrete depth, and H is going to be the concrete total depth. So usually, if you like to refer to the concrete depth, D is going to be this one. Total depth of the beam is going to be this one. If you like to call this beam, and let's say that you call that this beam is going to be 12 by 24. So what is 12? Usually, if you say 12 by 24, what is a beam 12 by 24? You say 12 is going to be the width, 24 is going to be the total depth. You don't call this depth. If you like to specify a beam in a drone, or if you like to describe it to someone, you say the beam is 12 by 24, 24 is going to be the total depth, not the depth to the rebar. Depth to the rebar is important in our analysis. But if you like to build it, you need to give them the total depth. This makes sense to you guys. So, okay, let me go back here. Now, the beam here is going to start to deform. Concrete has very slight resistance when it comes to tension. So, the tensile stress is going to be very small in the concrete. So, concrete will fail after it sees a very slight tensile stress. You are talking about maybe 300, 400 psi. If you go back to the previous slide, concrete takes up to, let's say, for 5,000 concrete, how much it takes as in compression stress? You say it takes up to 5,000 psi because this is the reason I called it 5,000 psi concrete. But when it comes to tension, it takes maybe about 10% of this or even less. So the concrete is taking 5,000 compression, maybe in tension is taking 400 only, 400 psi. So it doesn't take much. Which means if I put this beam here and I apply no load at all, the stress top and bottom is going to be equal to zero. There is no tension, no compression. Once you put the beam and then you put two supports just under its own weight, some stress is going to start to develop just based on the weight itself because the weight is like a load. But just under the self-weight of the beam, the stresses here is going to be very small. And the concrete will not crack at that point, most likely. Now, if crack is going to happen, do you think any cracks are going to happen on the top? You say no. Concrete is going to be in compression on the top. No cracks. In order for it to crack, you need to have some tension at the bottom. And the crack is going to happen only at the bottom, not on the top, as long as the moment is going to be in this direction. I said, okay, good. So if I just put the beam under its own weight, do you think it's going to crack at the bottom? I'm going to say most likely no. Because the amount of stresses that you develop here at the bottom of this beam is going to be less than, let's say, the tensile strength of the beam. How much tensile strength of the concrete beam? I'm going to say maybe 400 psi, like what I mentioned, 300 psi, which means if the stress here at the bottom is going to be within 300 psi, I'm not expecting any cracks and the beam is not going to be cracking. But once the stress at the bottom fibers is going to be going beyond 
the tenth strength of the concrete, which is about 400 to 500 PSI, or maybe 300, depends on the concrete quality. I'm gonna start here to see some cracks. And now at this point, the three bars is gonna see the tension. So before the concrete is gonna start to crack under very slight loading, the three bars, it's not there as if they are not doing anything yet for you. I'm gonna go back here to this line. At certain point in the past, you guys have studied curvature. In math, sometimes in physics, it depends what you have studied before. Professor, can you repeat again where you said stress, when stress is above what that causes cracking? Okay, I, I'll go back again to it. I'll go back to it, okay? We'll mm -hmm. it. So here's the beam when it deflects under an applied moment. And this center line of the beam is gonna be a section of, or a part of a big circle. Now, of course, when the flexion is gonna be very limited, this radius of the circle is gonna be very large, right? If the flexion is gonna be half an inch or an inch, and the beam is 30 feet long, the diameter is gonna be so big of the circle, and so the radius. Radius of this circle is called draw, and we call it also radius of curvature. Like in here, you see this radius of curvature? <laughs> And this radius of curvature, the inverse of it, is called the curvature. So the inverse of this one over rho is gonna be equal to phi, which is the curvature. If you can develop an equation here for the deflection of this beam, and the deflection, we're gonna call it y, which means y here is gonna be the deflection. Second derivative of this deflection equation is gonna get you one over rho, which means it's gonna be equal to the curvature itself. So y double dashes, which is a curvature, is give you the second derivative of the deflection equation. Now, is this critical? I'm gonna say maybe at this point, not that critical, but later on you're gonna see that this can be very useful to us in our analysis. Okay, thank you. I, I'm, I'm still, I did not answer you yet. As I said, I'm coming to it. I'm going to be going more in details about the stress. So I'm coming to it. So what's going to happen here, once you apply these forces and the beam is going to deflect, you're going to have a strain in the top and the bottom. Let's say the strain of the top and bottom, we're going to call it absence of C. This give you the strain, top or bottom. Right? This is gonna be the maximum strain. Why? Because the strain here in the top is not gonna be the same as the strain in the middle. Usually you assume the strain in the middle is gonna be equal to zero because if this is gonna be here compression, it's gonna be tension right at the middle, it's gonna be nothing. It's not gonna be going anywhere. So the strain here is gonna be zero, the strain here is gonna be maximum compression, the strain here is gonna be maximum tension. All right? So the strain here, the maximum strain is gonna be equal to absence of seam. One half of the height h is called c, lowercase, not c uppercase. So usually c uppercase is used for force. It's gonna be c lowercase, which means one half of the depth. Which depth? I'm gonna move here forward one slide and tell about this gonna be h. One half of it is called c, like what you have done here in mechanics of materials. In the past, we used to have this term c and h and b, same terms that we have used in the past. So if you take the strain here divided by one half of the height, it's gonna get you the same as this curvature. Maybe at this point, I'm just trying here to address certain items, 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 and then at the end, we're gonna be linking them together. For this given strain, you're gonna have a stress, right? So as I was saying here, you apply some forces, you get the strains, first you get deflection, and when the beam deflects, you're gonna get here strains, gonna be compression strain, compression strains here, and tensile strains here. Concrete is not gonna crack in compression, but it's gonna crack in tension. But when do you think it's gonna crack? 
we say concrete is gonna crack here at the bottom once the stress at the bottom is gonna be going beyond the cracking stress. So what's the cracking stress? The cracking stress is gonna be a limit of the concrete. And how much is this limit when it comes to concrete? I'm gonna say roughly about 10% of the maximum compressible stress. For example, I'm gonna say, I am planning to use here 4,000 PSI concrete. You know what's 4,000 PSI concrete? 4,000 PSI means maximum compression that this concrete spacement can take is gonna be 4,000 PSI. If you plan to use 4,000 PSI concrete, the tensile stress for it is roughly about 10% of that, which means about 400 PSI. So what is a 400 PSI? 400 PSI is gonna be a limit. Once the stress at the bottom of the beam at the tension side is gonna be approaching the 400 PSI, concrete is gonna to start to crack. Are we good now? Did I answer your question? Yes, I answered. All right, good. All right. So here's gonna be the tension side. This is gonna be the compression side, as we're saying. Once the tension side here is gonna be reaching the tensile strain, and how much is the tensile stress, excuse me, the tensile stress of the concrete? How much is this according to ACI code? It says here FCR, which means the cracking stress, if cracking, according to the ACR, is equal to 7.5, screw root of F prime C. What is F prime C? Concrete strength at 28 days, like the 4,000 piece side we're talking about. So it's not really 10%. 10% was just a rough estimate. We have an equation for it. The equation says 7.5 is root of F prime C. Now, here's the first equation that I see here in this business of concrete design. My question is, what unit should I use for F prime C? So once again, say, can I use K sign for F prime C? Or can I use Newton per millimeter square or per meter square, like in a Pascal? Can I use PSI? The answer to all of that, ACI is a PSI code. Please write this down. ACI is a PSI code. All the equations should be done based on pound and inches only. If you see any equation, the code, it has to be pound and inch. Don't use pound foot, don't use kip inch. No, don't use KSI. An equation like this, it has to be PSI. So anything related to concrete design in the code equations, it is based on PSI units. In some cases, I can work around it and use KSI, but I need to know what I'm doing. I cannot just use it here blindly. In an equation like this, it has to be PSI. I can tell you the reason. If I take here a strength of 4,000, concrete strength of 4,000, if prime C is gonna be 4,000. Can I say that 7.5 is root of F prime C of 4,000 is the same as I take it of 4K psi and divide the whole thing here by 1,000? Did you get guys uh, the question? Is the question clear or no? I'm sorry, can you repeat it one more time, the question? Give me a sec, let me do this. Here's what I'm saying. Here's FCR. My F prime C is equal to 5,000. Can I just use here 5,000? Or it is okay to use 5,000 here as 5K psi. And then come at the end, divide the whole equation here by 1,000. No. 
cannot, I guess, right? Give me a sec. Question two is which equation is correct? The top or the bottom? The top. Top. Can I use this equation? Say seven and a half square root of five divided by a thousand. Would you get the same answer? No. You cannot. No, it will be different. You cannot. So you got to be careful here. All the code equations they are going to be based on PSI units. Don't ever try to use KSI units in here unless you know what you're doing. Otherwise, you're gonna get weird answers and weird numbers in your analysis. So, okay, now I have an idea when the concrete is gonna start to crack and concrete is gonna start to crack when well, the tension side only is gonna be reaching this stress value. So, okay. Here's the beam exposed to some stress and the stress here at the bottom, which means the tension side, is going to be within the cracked stress or cracked in stress. What is the crack in stress? I'm going to say it's the same value. This is the limit I was just talking about, the seven and a half square root of the function. So as long as the tensile stress is not reached yet, you can expect this type of distribution in the stresses. No cracking yet. So this picture here is going to be uncracked concrete section. Why it is uncracked? Because I know that the stress at the bottom here, in the tension side, is not going to be approaching the seven and a half square root of the frequency. In detail A here, this is going to be the stress that you have seen before when you're doing some analysis in mechanics of materials. This is what you should expect. The top is going to be compression, at the bottom is going to be tension. And this is going to be the equation for the stress value at any point. This is your sigma, which means the stress. This is going to be the moment applied by the y divided by the moment of inertia. What is this y? y is gonna be the distance from the neutral axis. This is actually what we call here neutral axis. This is gonna be the line where you have zero stress. There is no tension, no compression. And the distance measured from here to any point of interest that you're interested in the stress here is gonna be called distance of y. Now h over two here is gonna be equal to how much? Usually you guys used to use a symbol for it. You used to call it c. So I'm going to say C is going to be equal to H over 2. So the maximum Y value is going to be equal to C lowercase. So sigma max, which means the stress in the top here, is going to be equal to the moment times C for H over 2 divided by the moment of inertia. Have you guys seen this before in mechanics of materials? Or not really? Yeah. yeah. Does the original equation has the negative also included? Negative MY over I? Well, the negative value here just depends on the direction of the moment. Uh -huh. So for example, if you say negative, if you start here to put the negative side, what does it mean by that? It means one side is gonna be positive, one side is gonna be negative, correct? Yes. If you just say M, and then you say it's gonna be negative m, this is okay. So in this case, y in this case is gonna be positive, and once y is gonna be merged to the bottom, it's gonna be negative. Mm -hmm. So negative times negative is gonna be positive. If this is the way you'd like to use it, this is fine. But this is like the general way of looking at the equation. Okay. So the, 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 the sign is gonna be decided by the y right here. Exactly. So it is decided by the y, and for now, I'm just ignoring the sign. I'm gonna say y here is gonna be positive, y here is gonna be positive, but the, at the end, you need to look at the direction of the stress. <laughs> if you like to use this equation here without any signs, this would be fine, as long as you are careful and you understand the difference between compression and tension. And this Thank you. Sense. No problem. So I'm gonna say A and B is exactly the same thing. Look at the stress. 
You see this one and you see this one, they're the same, right? All what I have done, just flip this here, but the direction of the stress is the same. This is going to be compression, this is tension, this is also tension compression. Look at the direction of the arrows. So I should be able to draw it this way. This is stress here, I can draw it in a 3D picture, like what you're seeing here. And you understand that if you see here any stress, you multiply by an area, it's going to get you a force because the stress is going to be equal to a force divided by an area. Therefore, the force is going to be equal to stress times an area. So actually this force, the compression force, I can use the term C for it. And all the tension force, I can call it T here. Compression force here, if you like, compared to the stress, is going to be equal to the volume of this prism, if you like. This block here, the volume of it is going to be equal to the compression force. If you like to understand it more or to feel it, I'm going to say, if the stress here is uniform, just have one value. How do you find out the force? You say, just take this uniform stress, multiply by the cross-section area. But here, it is not uniform. It has this triangular distribution. So the volume of this block or prism is going to be equal to the compression force. So what is the volume of this block? The volume is going to be equal to sigma C, which means sigma at point C in the top, the maximum stress, times B, times H over 2, divide this by 2. Why divide this by H over 2? Because you're trying to find out the area of this triangle. Area of this triangle, if you like to do it separate, you say area of this triangle is going to be equal to sigma C, maximum stress, times H over 2, divide by 2, is going to be area of this piece. Multiply by B, you get the volume. And with that, you can figure out the amount of compression force C. I guess in my case here, C has to be equal to T because there is no applied external force in that direction. You simply just figure out one force and then you say summation of the force in this direction equal to zero. Therefore, C is going to be equal to T. This is one way to feel about it. Another way to think about it, you say, what's the difference between the stress distribution here and there? The stress on the top is giving the stress at the bottom. Why? Because neutral axis happen in the middle. And here the concrete is homogeneous material. So in this case, with this distribution, this distribution, this sigma is the same as this sigma. So the equation that you applied here to find out the volume is giving you the same one that you use at the bottom. So this force tension is giving you the same as the compression. They're equal to each other. There is no way that they're going to be different. The reason because, again, neutral axis have to write at the mid-height. And the stress at the bottom is the same as the stress at the top. So why would they be different? Now my question to you is, where do you think this C is going to happen? Where is the point of application? I'm going to say it's going to be at one third from the top. Am I correct? Because it's going to be here triangular distribution. So C is going to be one third from the top. And T is going to be at one third from the bottom of this triangle. The distance between them, I can just call it JD. Some distance, some Y distance. I don't care about it for now. All right. Now, let's put here some values. Let's put some equations because now I need to figure out how can I do the stress distribution and I need to have some symbols and I'd like to start to do it. I say, okay. In the previous slide here, it was just rectangular section. It was so simple. But in reality, here's a concrete section is gonna look like this. It's like the general case. That was kind of a special case, just rectangle. Let's give you the general case. So first, I need to figure out the moment of inertia for this shape. Why moment of inertia? Let me take you back one step, previous slide. Here's the equation for the stress determination. Equation says m divided by y, m divided by i times y. Say so, okay. I have the moment. I need the moment of inertia. How I can do here the moment of inertia for this section? You can see first. I need to find the CG. Center of gravity of this section. So I'm gonna say okay. Center of gravity, I have taken this in the statics. Also, I have done it in mechanics of materials. I should be able to find out the centroid of this section. Is anyone there who doesn't know how to do this 
centroid. And don't feel shy if you cannot do it. Um, I can maybe look for some old information from previous class and post it there for you guys. How to find the centroid of a section. Yes? Can you post it as a reminder? Okay, I'll put it there for you. Thank you. No problem. So, once you find the centroid, now you should be able to find out the moment of inertia for this section. Moment of inertia for any rectangular section is given by this equation. It's going to be bh cubed divided by 12. What is b? Here's b. Here's h. It's going to be bh cubed divided by 12. This is going to be the general equation for a moment of inertia for a rectangular section. How about the moment of inertia for this section here, for a T section or an I section or any other section? I'm gonna say I need to split this into two sections. One of them is gonna be the flange, the other one is gonna be the stem or the web. Right? We're gonna be going through examples, detailed examples. So this kind of review to what you guys have done in mechanics of material. Total moment of inertia is gonna be equal to the moment of inertia of section number one by itself about its centroid plus moment of inertia of section number two about its centroid. This is what I'm saying here. Summation of moment of inertia for this rectangular sections. And then you add to it the cross-section area of each subsection. This is going to be section one. This is going to be section two. Times the distance from its centroid to the global centroid squared, AY squared. So there's some way, and I can put some examples, and we can go through some analysis, and we'll do examples. But what you need to get to here, we have some equations to figure out the moment of inertia here. And in the book, you have detailed example that shows you how to do it, as a reminder for what you have taken here in mechanics of materials. And again, I'm going to be posting something about this. Now we're good. We know how to do moment of inertia for this T section, a generic section. It's going to be moment of inertia. Once you do the moment of inertia, and you have the centroid location, you have here a few values. You have something called y top. What is the y top? It's gonna be distance from neutral axis to the top of the section, which means from here to here. In this case, based on this numeric values, it's gonna be, let's say two inches here, plus 6.67, it's gonna be 8.67. So I'm gonna say, what is y top? Distance from the centroid of the section to top fiber of the beam. And what is Y bottom? Y bottom distance from neutral axis to bottom fibers. Distance from this all the way to there, which is 15.33 in this numerical example. Are you good? Questions? We understand definition of moment of inertia for the section. We know what is Y top, we know what's Y bottom. Am I correct? Yes? Yeah. No. Or should I go more into this? Okay. Good. Now, what is the section modulus? We have something that we call here S, T, and S bar. What is the section modulus? Anyone recall this section modulus? Section modulus is equal to? All right, that's fine. We're going to come to it. Now, the stress here. F top and F bottom. What is F top and F bottom? Oh, this is F top and this is F bottom. Are they equal? I'm going to say no. Why? Because the neutral axis is not in the mid height. And the stress distribution here is different from the stress distribution there. If I go back here one slide, look at the stress here. I said that they are equal. I was correct because we have symmetry. That was a very specific case. This is a special case. I just have a rectangle. When you have rectangular shape here, the stress on the top and bottom are just the same. In this case, the stress on top and bottom, they're not going to be the same because neutral axis is not at the mid height. It's going to be shifted up. Why? Because you have here more material, you have more meat here than at the bottom. So I said, okay. So the stress on the top is not going to be the same as the stress on the bottom. I'm not interested in the stress at any point just for the maximum value here and for the maximum value there. It's going to be compression side. It's going to be tension side. 
So I'm gonna call this F top, it's gonna be F bar. How do you find here the stress? I'm gonna be using the same equation like this. The equation says F on the top is gonna be equal to the moment, applied moment from the moment diagram, divided by the moment of inertia that we're just talking about, the total moment of inertia for the entire section, multiplied by Y top. So usually the equation says M divided by I times Y. So what is M is gonna be the moment applied moment as in kip foot, as in pound inch. Divide by the moment of inertia and units for moment of inertia is gonna be inch to the fourth. So I said, okay, M divided by I times Y. Where is Y? It's gonna be Y top from here to there. How about moment at the bottom? I'm gonna say the stress at the bottom. I'm gonna say the stress at the bottom is gonna be equal to the same moment divided by the same moment of inertia for the entire section. But in this case, you multiply by Y bottom. Y bottom is gonna be from here to there. It's gonna be Y bottom. So I have a way here and I have some equations given to me to determine the stress on the top and the bottom. Now, where is the tensile stress is gonna happen? Is it top or bottom when I have positive moment like in this case? I'm gonna say the stress at the bottom is gonna be tension. The stress on the top is gonna be compression. So how can I figure out if this beam has cracked already or not? So I'm going to say it is easy. What you need to do is to figure out the stress at the bottom. What do you do after this? You compare it with the cracking stress. How much is the cracking stress? I'm going to say it is given in this equation. So once the stress at the bottom is going to be very close for approaching this value here, which means seven and a half square root of a prime C, it means that your beam is cracking. If the stress here is going to be below the limit cracking the stress, your beam is not cracking yet, and you should be fine. All right? But we're not done yet with the slide. Look here at the stress equation. It says M over I times Y. And then it says, which is the same as M divided by S. What is ST? It's going to be the section modulus. So what is S? T, ST is gonna be equal to the moment of inertia divided by Y top. If you take the moment of inertia for the entire section divided by Y top, it's gonna to something that we call here section modulus for the top. Same thing for the bottom. What is SB? If you take here, the moment of inertia divided by YB, it's gonna get to SB. We have all of this written here. So where's the definition here of the section modulus? I guess it's right here. Look at this. S top is equal to what? I divided by Y. Yeah, it's gonna be this. I divided by Y. I divided by YB. So it is either that you figure out the moment of inertia and then you have Y top and bottom, or you do section modulus top and bottom. It's gonna be up to you. It's, it's fine. It should be fine. There's no problem with this. Is it fine? Now, any question about this slide, about the concept? Not the details of calculating this. I know that you are going to be going through this. Any questions of the concept? What, what you're looking here at? Don't let go. If you have a question, ask it now. Because the upcoming stuff is going to be built on what I've just covered. When I don't hear an answer, it means either that everybody sleep or it doesn't make any sense, but I'm talking. No questions. No questions, all right. So um, if I'm looking here at the stress distribution over this, I'm gonna say this is completely different from this over there. Because in here, the block or the prism is gonna be so simple. It's gonna be one of the triangular shapes. Like in here, it's gonna be one of these. Right? But for the stress distribution here, it's not gonna be like here because this is like a T section. But if you find out the volume of this distribution and the volume of distribution, this volume here is gonna be equal to the tension force and this volume is gonna be equal to the compression force. And you know what? This tension force is gonna be the same as the compression. Why? From statics, this section is in equilibrium, is stable, which means you do some measure of the force in this direction equals zero. C is going to be equal to T. There's no way around this. All right. 
Let's see the first example. We're going to have a numerical example. It is going to be a rectangular shape. This is going to be the good thing. I'm not going to have one of these tough sections to work with. This is going to be only in the homework. <laughs> Excuse me. Some examples. Excuse me. Yes. Do, we have, uh, do we do anything about the shear stresses also in our yeah. design? Yeah, yeah. But okay. it's, yeah, it's coming. Not now. Okay, it's coming. coming. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So to start some numerical examples, I need to start with the very easy stuff, right? To make it, I mean, otherwise it's not going to make any sense for us. So I guess I'm going to start here with this rectangular section. H is equal to, you see guys, H, how much is H? 24. 24 inch and B? 16. Okay, now we know the symbols, right, that we need to use. How about D? How much is D? 21. Very good. D is going to be 21, right. It's going to be from the center of the rebar, not from the bottom of the rebar, not from the top of the rebar. It's going to be merged from the center of the rebar. Also, I have this reinforcing information. This is going to be the stress strain relationship. It says here that the steel is going to be grade 60, yield of threads is going to be 0 0.0021, ES 29,000 KSI, the standard concrete is going to be 4,000, maximum is going to happen at 0 0.02, maximum strain is going to happen at 0 0.03. Before I go through this example, I just want to bring this to your attention. Something is not really related to the specific example, but you need to look at it. For grade 60 steel, and for this concrete, you'll notice that when the concrete at max, the strain is 0.02, and also at the yield point, the strain is equal to 0.02, very close from each other, which is good for us, just happy. Now let's go back to our example. In this example here, they're asking about this cracking moment. What's the cracking moment? I'm wondering, what is the cracking moment? I'm gonna say, it's gonna be that moment if you apply it to this concrete beam, it's going to start to crack. So it's going to be like a limit. The cracking moment is going to be the limit of that section for the beam to start to crack. Okay. I guess just the physical understanding for it, I need to understand what does mean by the word here, cracking moment. It's going to be like a limit, right? If the moment applied to the beam, is going to be below this point here, it means no cracking is going to happen. If you apply a moment higher than the cracking moment, the beam is going to crack. That's what it means. Now first, I'm looking for when the concrete is going to start to crack. Concrete is going to start to crack once the stress at the bottom, the tension side, is going to be right there, 7.5 square root of F prime C. So you're going to say, okay, 7.5 square root of 4,000. I cannot say 7.5 Screw to four divided by a thousand. As we said, I cannot do this. It just happened here that the cracking stress equals 474.3 PSI. Uh, professor, the 4,000 yeah. comes from where? 4,000, where it's come from? Yes. F prime C, concrete strength, which is this number here. Okay. Yeah, this gave me the concrete strength at 28 days, which is called F prime C. You see this term here, F prime C, 4,000? Okay. So the concrete is going to crack at 474 PSI. I said, fine, good. Right at the cracking, the stress at the bottom is going to be equal to FCR. And my moment equation says the cracking, any cracking or any stress is going to be equal to M divided by S. Let me go back. At the bottom, FB, the stress at the bottom, is going to be equal to M over S. So fine. If you like to find out the cracking moment, what do you do? You set FB to be the same as a cracking stress at the limit. You determine SB. Multiply SB by FB, which is a cracking stress in this case, you get the cracking moment. Are we clear about this or no? Yeah. Anyone has a question about this? Thank you for answering. 
let me repeat this again. I have an equation here that says the stress equals to m divided by s. So fine. This general equation here, if you give me the moment, and I, of course for the given section, I have this s sub b, I'm gonna be taking the moment divided by s sub b, I'm gonna figure out the amount of stress at the bottom. I said, fine, the equation is good. Now I understand it. Now I said, how much is that moment to, to cause cracking? I'm gonna say, if you can specify for me the cracking stress, I'm gonna be taking this multiplied by S sub B is gonna get to the cracking moment. What's the cracking moment now? It's gonna be the moment at which the stress is gonna be reaching to, in this case, 474 P sign. I said, okay, now it makes sense. So how much is the cracking stress again? It's gonna be equal to M divided by S. That was simple because I have a rectangular section. The section models for rectangular section is given by this equation. This is also for mechanical material. I'm gonna post some information about this so that you guys have it handy. It's gonna be BT squared, T or H, it's the same thing, but not D. It's gonna be equal to 16 inch times 24 squared divided by six. Where did I get this from? I said, okay, 16 times 24 squared divided by six. Yes, it's gonna be 1536 inch cube. Now I have S. And they have FCR from this equation. Therefore, the moment equals, here it is. 474 PSI, the stress is gonna be equal to M divided by S. Therefore, M equals, you can just take this, multiply by that. Now look at the units. This here PSI, and how about this? Inch cubed. So I have inch and pound, inch and pound. All right, so this moment here, the cracking moment is gonna be this big number. If you take this number here, divide by 12, it's gonna be pound foot. If you take the same number again, divide by a thousand, it's gonna be kif foot. And this explains here the conversion from here to there. So now the cracking moment is gonna be 60.7 kif foot. For this concrete section to crack, it needs a moment of 60.7 mm -hmm. kif foot. Any questions? No, professor. Yeah. All right, any questions? All right, now I'm done with today's lecture. If you have any question, I'm not gonna provide here new material, but I'm here to answer your questions. So for this example here, I'm gonna be here. If you have any questions, they just go through it again. If you have any questions from the beginning of the lecture, I can just go through it and answer your question. Otherwise, if you like to leave, please go ahead and sign your name and leave if you want to. Thank you, Professor. No problem, no problem. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Sure, go ahead, please. So you were mentioning about the FCR yeah. and the FB. Um, are they like the same? Okay. Well, because you were using like the same. Sure. I can explain this, no problem. Okay. Absolutely. Um, this FB, this is like an equation from mechanics of materials, if you recall, right? And this equation here, it's so simple. It says the stress in the bottom, which means in the tension side in this case, is gonna be equal to the moment applied moment. So this applied moment is gonna be the moment that you can determine, let's say, basal structure analysis or statics. It's divided by the section models, which means property of the section, right? For any given section, you should be able to figure out S sub B. With that, I should be able to figure out the stress all the way at the bottom here. So, okay, now this equation is good. I understand it. And I can just use it safely. You give me the moment, you give me the section properties, right? I can figure out the stress. Now I said, okay, now let me ask you this question. When do you think this section is gonna crack? So you're gonna crack means that you're looking for the cracking stress, like a limit or the actual stress that happened there when you applied the moment. You say no, when I say here the cracking stress, it means the limit, right? At what stress do you think that this beam is gonna crack? 
I'm gonna say the code here gives me an equation, the ACR. The equation says that the concrete is gonna crack at this value here. Of course, in the tension side, right? So this value is gonna be a limit. Does it make sense now? This value is a limit. If the stress at the bottom is gonna be reaching this value, the concrete is gonna crack. This is what the code says. I said, okay. Does it mean that FCR, I can just use it instead of FB? I'm gonna say yes, you can. Because it's gonna be a stress value at the bottom when the section is cracking. But in this case, this equation, right? Someone's gonna say, can I use the previous moment that I used when I was just doing the actual stress? I say no. Because in this equation here, you have three variables. If I give you two, you should be able to figure out the third one. If I give you the moment, I give you the section, you figure out the stress. Now in this case, you have a limit, which means that you say, let me say, what happened when the stress is gonna be equal to F prime um, FCR, which is a seven and a half square root of F prime C. You say, what happened in this case for this section properties, I can get you the moment at which the cracking is gonna start to occur. So it's true, you can use FCR in the of F sub B in that location. To determine here the moment limit. Okay, I understand now. Thank you. No problem. No problem. Uh, professor? Yes. When we mentioned earlier in the lecture um, for the units in PSI, is that only for the F critical? And or the all the equations, if the equation, if someone's telling you here, this equation from the code, it has to be in PSI. Okay. Is this equation from the code? No, I said mechanics of materials, right? Right. Okay. But how about this one? This That's from the code. Equation. We mentioned that this is going to be taken from the code. Where did we mention this? I'm going to take you back here. Right there. Right there. ACI says, okay, this code equation. So use PSI. So um, for, for that equation, we use um, PSI units. Did you also mention something about all ACI equations require PSI? Yeah. Everything in the ACI equation, it has to be in PSI. Okay. It's written for PSI. When you open the code and then you look, let's say, at the stress, uh, steel strength or concrete strength, you see your concrete strength, they never call it 4 KSI, they call it 4,000 PSI. Look at the yield strength definition. You're going to see it means where the steel is going to be yielding and then comma PSI. So everything is going to be in PSI. Look at the previous slide set. Let me show you this. It's all in PSI. You see F prime C, PSI, F prime C, PSI, right? Even for the steel. I don't have here anything related to the steel, but give me a sec. Um, it's going to be all in PSI. Look at F sub Y, it is all in PSI. So if you see any equation, take it from the code, you need to use PSI. Unless you know exactly what you're doing. So after a certain amount of, let's say, experience that you'll develop, you'll figure out, yeah, I can do this. And then at another incident, you're gonna say, no, 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 you cannot use it. It has to be in PSI. Especially when you have this root of V prime. So this gonna be one of the big equations that you need to be very careful with it. Once you see something like this, and you say, oh, because the square root of 4,000 is not equal to square root of four divided by 1,000, right? Otherwise, you should be fine. I mean, using PSI or KSI should be fine. So for now, I'm gonna say, let's stick here with PSI, and over time, you'll learn the confidence and, and you'll figure out when to use PSI, when to use KSI. Right. Professor, can, um, can I ask you a question about, about the homework? Yeah, you can. Why not? Um, question number three. Um, at point D, there's a internal hinge. Yes. Um, and then you said something about that the moment, um, that the moment is zero. This is true. On uh, one, one side of the hinge, the moment is zero. Um, 
so the hinge, does it also have a, a vertical reaction force or? Yeah. Okay. But what happened if you think about this beam, this is like two beams attached to each other at this end. Oh, I see. Okay. So what happened, you need to solve the easier one at the beginning. So which one do you think is supporting the other? Do you think the left beam is supporting the right beam or the right beam supporting the left beam? the right supporting the left so if we cut it through here which one is going to be stable which one's going to be unstable cut it right here oh um the left will be stable the right, right will be unstable so the right side needs help mm -hmm. so what is supporting the other one left is supporting the right or right supporting the left uh the, the left supports the right uh-huh because if I cut this off, this can be collapsing. So it, this needs help. Otherwise, then can be standing this way, right? Mm -hmm. so, okay. So if I'd like to solve this problem, I'm gonna be cutting these two beams right here and solve the right one first. My understanding, if I have your thin caps, this gave be the middle, this support would see five caps and the other one would see five caps which means that the right beam here dumps five caps on the left beam right here. Okay. Make sense now? All right, so um, treat these as two beams um, for, for the right? Beams. Absolutely, you can treat it as two beams. Okay, um, when I isolate the, the right-hand side, yeah. um, I'll have a reaction at C, the 10 caps going down, but I will not have anything on on the other end at point B. Give me a sec. Let me do something. Now you see the screen, right? Yeah. So what I'm saying is, you can just cut them right here, right? Mm -hmm. So in this case here is gonna be one beam, there's a point load, and here's the other beam. The reaction that I have here is give you five caps, right? And the reaction here is give you five caps. Mm -hmm. If you split them, so whatever reaction that you put in here, you need to put it back on this beam. That's five oh, caps. Oh, I see. Okay. So now you have a new beam. It's give you, looks like this. It has some uniform load. Mm -hmm. It has a point load right here of six caps and some uniform load of two caps per foot. And then on the top of that, it has five caps here. Okay. Now, where does this five caps come from? From the effect of this beam here, because I just split it out just to get uh -huh. it. Okay. All right, yeah, okay, that's helpful. No problem. Thank you. No problem. Um, professor, so we just uh, submit the uh, homework on Canvas, right? Yeah. Okay, Don't send it via email. Okay. Professor, is there another assignment? Is there a what? Is there another assignment due next class or not? Um, no, it's not going to be due Monday or um, Tuesday. It's going to be due um, end of the week. Oh, okay. Not so it's been assigned yet. Okay. Yeah. So in every week you have one assignment. I'm not gonna give you two assignments in one week. I can give it to you, but the due date is gonna be once a week. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you. No problem. Have a good one. You too. All right. Good night.
Um, on a hinge in the graph, is it just like a regular, like a, you graph it like a point? Yeah. Like a regular, okay. 